Hi everyone, this is Robin Holman from NeuroCat Chat. And today we are here to talk about how our body is able to take mechanical compression and tensile load forces to provide neural input into the central nervous system to aid in the process of developing our body schema of our egocentric awareness of space. Ego means self, so where am I in relation to myself? We are gonna focus our, our um, conversation on the sensory apparatuses that live within contractile tissue muscle spindles, and Golgi tendon organs, which is actually tensile load tissue. But anyways, so we have within our muscle belly, so this is a soleus over here, here's our muscle, we have these large fibers called extrafusal muscle fibers, and they are the ones that promote concentric, eccentric, and isometric contraction. And then we have specialized intrafusal muscle fibers that live within the muscle belly. For visual purposes, I've elongated the spindle on the horizontal. Now, those intrafusal muscle fibers, whether it's a nuclear bag or nuclear chain, have afferent nerve endings that wrap around these fibers circumferentially and are sensitive to the change of length of the muscle. So as the muscle contracts, compress on this nerve ending, as the muscle lengthens, tensile load force upon the nerve ending. And depending on the force, it will either excite or inhibit the nerve ending. That information is sent to dorsal horn of the spinal column. And the muscle spindles can elicit two different responses. You can either A, send information cortically, or B, create the monosynaptic reflex, single synapse. That reflex is sensitive to rapid change of muscle spindle, and it will either synapse on the motor efferent of the same muscle fiber that says, hey, so let's say the soleus in this case, hey soleus, you're quickly stretching, contract. It can synapse on a synergistic muscle, and in this case would be the gastrocnemius, and say, hey, Soleus is being lengthened, contract, plantar flex. And also, it synapses on the antagonist muscle, which in this case could be the anterior tibialis. And it says, hey, soleus is being lengthening really quickly. You need to relax so that we can elicit a plantar flexion response. Our Golgi tendon organ is slightly different. It lives in the myotendinous junction, myomuscle tendon. And about here. Here's an, along, or here's an enlargement of that image. The afferent nerve endings are similar where they wrap in between the tendinous tissue and they're also sensitive to change length. And they're more in a series. So this is in the parallel with muscle fibers. This is in series with the muscle fiber. This information is also sent to the dorsal horn. So how does our cortex know how my body is positioned in space? So that information is then sent to the gracili fasciculus, sent up ipsilateral spinal cord all the way to the medulla, where it eventually crosses over to the contralateral thalamus, then be directed into the appropriate sensory cortex, Information is also sent redundantly into the cerebellum and the vestibular nucleus, where it could also be uh, inputted and have influence on, say, spinal, ocular, and uh, vestibular responses. Now, why is it important for a physical therapist to understand this mechanism? So let's talk about individuals who suffer from either a traumatic brain injury uh, or, say, a cerebrovascular accident. And Let's just say it's in within the middle cerebral artery, and there's an infarct there that has influence in tissue death of the frontal and parietal cortex, and maybe my uh, primary sensory cortex was involved, and I'm suffering from hemiparesis on one side. We know that physical therapists will often use electrical stimulation to try to wake up the muscle so that we can regain function. Now, how does that mechanism actually work? It actually uses muscle spindle and GTO uh, input in order to produce that effect. So if I produce and provide enough electrical stimulation, voltage, that will elicit a contraction within the muscle belly, 
The intention is, is that even without cortical input to say contract, you can provide sensation to muscle spindle and GTO that is then sent up the chain and hopefully with the redundancies in the central nervous system that we can provide awareness of this region to the brain so that we can potentially provide neuroplastic changes to regain functionality of that muscle again. So you must contract enough to create a visible contraction to stimulate this tissue. How does the somatosensory in, uh, system influence our balance? Now we know that balance is not provided by just one single sensory system. Now when I talk about one, I'm talking about out of visual, vestibular, and somatosensory. It's a supplement uh, to these systems to provide balance. There's some research done by Alman. Oh gosh, I can't pronounce his name. I'm gonna write it for you. It's P F A L T Z Pafaltz. Anyways, him and Nashner and Shumway Cook did a lot of investigation on the influence of motor control and how we maintain our balance. And what they found is, is that if you don't have input from multiple systems, your balance is off. Go figure, right? So for an example, my body doesn't know the difference between dorsiflexing my ankle because, well, let's say I'm on a tilt board, right? So this is the board, and that board can tilt posteriorly or anteriorly. Now if I'm standing on that board, and that board is tilting up, you could see that my ankles potentially dorsiflex. So my somatosensory system, my spindles, my GTO say, hey, you're dorsiflexing your ankle. But if you don't have input from our visual system or our vestibular system, then we don't know the difference between, am I leaning forward and I'm getting dorsiflexion? Or is there a supporting surface that's leaning posteriorly, and my weight's actually translating backwards? And what Alman Pafaltz found is that those with bilateral vestibular loss, and they were able to confirm bilateral vestibular loss because negative caloric testing to produce an nystagmus and uh, negative VOR bilaterally. And uh, it was because of either autotoxic uh, medication or uh, viral infections. Anyways, individuals with bilateral vestibular loss did not perform very well with the task of the board leaning posteriorly because they were trying to rely on their somatosensory system because they didn't have the vestibular system, and they did it with the eyes closed, or visual to say, hey, which way am I going? Am I leaning anteriorly or am I leaning posteriorly? And so, Interestingly, those with bilateral vestibular loss, greater than two years, were actually able to stay upright with the task. But those who had bilateral vestibular loss more acutely within two years fell every single time. What that tells us is that potentially, if we have a loss of sensation in one region, that we can increase reliance upon our somatosensory system to maintain balance, which is one of our favorite words in physical therapy, balance. So anyways, that is a recap of how our body is able to take compression and tensile load forces to maintain upright balance.